In this chapter, we will be looking at probability distributions and in particular, the binomial distribution. Now we begin by talking about discrete random variables. In this problem below, this is an example of a discrete random variable X, which is the number of rooms in a home. Notice how the values of X form a discrete data set. That is, there's no decimals or fractions, and you can't have a house with 1.3 bedrooms in it. And for example, this just does not go on forever. It is a finite set. We're not gonna have a house that has 337 rooms in it, for example. So I, whenever you have a probability distribution, you have the variable and the different variables of the problem of the problem, but you also have the probability that each of these values occurs. So in a simple little example where we ask you to find the probability that X equals three in this distribution, basically we're just looking at that position in the table and that tells us the probability will be 0 0.473. Again, in this chapter, all about probability, Almost all of our answers are gonna begin with a zero. It's bad manners to leave that zero off in front of the decimal. And unless the problem tells you otherwise, we will generally be going four decimal places out. But because this table only goes to three decimal places, that's why this one stopped at the three. Okay, the next example has another type of table, but we didn't give you the probabilities. Okay, they, we are given a frequency distribution for the enrollment by grade in public secondary schools, high schools, and the frequencies are in thousands of students. So these ninth graders, there's not 3,604, that's 3,604,000, okay, because the data values are in thousands. Now I've gone ahead in advance and added these up to give you the total, which would really be 11,972,000 high school students. And we are choosing a student at random. Let X denote the grade level, that's our variable, and find the probability that X equals 10. Well, we go to our table and 3,131 out of the 11,972 is going to be that as expressed as a fraction, but it says in terms of percentages. So what I did on my calculator is I divided that out. I got it into decimal form. And anytime you go from decimal form to percentage, you move that decimal two places to the right. So this would be 26.15%. Okay, that's just a quick beginning for this chapter. Now we're gonna start talking about a couple of requirements for probability distribution. Just as in the previous chapter, the sum of all the probabilities must add up to one or 100%. And the probability of each event is going to be between zero and one. And here's that same notation we use, P of E, representing probability of an event. Now, in this next paragraph, I have a formula for you for how to go and calculate the expected value manually, but it's something that our calculator will do for you. But I will show you in this next example how we would do it. In this example, I have a probability distribution for the number of customers waiting at Benny's Barbershop in Cleveland. And if you were to show up at some random time, how many people would you expect to be waiting? That word expect is the clue that we're looking for in expected value. Now this table that we have here is a probability distribution. It's got our random variables and it's got the probability of each of them. And notice again, it forms a discrete data set. We can't have 1.3 people waiting in line while we get at this barber shop. And the list just doesn't go on forever. I mean, the building can only hold so many people. Now, if we were to go through and use the formula that I have in that previous paragraph, we take each X value and times it by its probability, and then we would add it all up. So we would be going zero times 0.424 plus one times the 0.161, plus two times the 0.134, et cetera. And that product to sum at the end would be the expected value. But for us, 
with our calculators, all we need to do is enter this into our first two lists in our calculator and do the one var stat L1, L2. Notice what I've done here is I've gone and I've entered those values into the calculator. And then after I've entered them into the first two lists, I went to my one variable statistics. And just as we did a few chapters back, here we go. We enter and do these calculations. Now the calculator gave me an expected value of 1.519, which would mean that we would be expecting one and a half people to be waiting in line anytime we went into this barber shop. But I wanted to call something to your attention that I don't have on this screen below. But when you look at the one variable statistics screen, in addition to give you the mean, it gives you two things. First off, it gives you n equals one. Well, that's kind of strange because we didn't sample, we, we really didn't sample any people at all. Our calculator doesn't know that we've entered probabilities. It's treating it just like a frequency distribution from a couple chapters back. And if you were to add up all of these probabilities, they should add up to one. And that's why when you uh, look at this, the value of n is equal to one. Now, if you were to look at that screen on your calculator, and I encourage all of you to stop and do this on your calculator, you would notice that there is no value for the sample standard deviation. Now, that is because if you go back and look at the formula for the standard deviation, one that we didn't really ever do, but we had s is equal to the square root of sigma of x minus x bar quantity squared all divided by n minus one. Now, if the calculator thinks n equals one and we go one minus one on the denominator, you should know from other math classes that that becomes an undefined value. And that's why there's no sample standard deviation listed for a probability distribution. Moving on to this next problem, we have a prize wheel problem here, where on the left, I have all the different prizes, and then I have the probability of each of those prizes when you spin the wheel. Notice that the highest value prize has the lowest of probability of occurring, and the prize with the least value has the highest probability. If you want to find the expected winnings, and here we go, back to that word expected again, you're going to find the expected value. You're going to enter these values into list one and list two in your calculator, and then you're going to do the one variable statistics on your calculator. Notice how the top line is our mean, $77.25. And that will be our expected value on this prize, our expected winnings on one spin. Now, this is based on a long number of spins because you cannot actually achieve a $77.25, but this is based on that phrase in the long run. Notice here again, as I was mentioning a moment ago, it thinks that n is equal to one. And notice also that the standard, the sample standard deviation is missing here because it cannot calculate that when it thinks that n is equal to one. Okay, continuing on to this next problem, very much the same problem, but this one's got a little bit of a twist on it. We've got a landscape contractor who bids on jobs, jobs where he can make a $3,000 profit. And the probability of getting one, two, three, or four jobs per month is shown. So we have all of our probabilities associated with each of those numbers of jobs. Now, those are going to get entered into list one and list two, as you would expect. And if we want the expected profit per month, we're going to go in and do our one variable statistics on list one and list two. Now, again, throughout this video, I recommend you pausing it and doing these yourself because I'm just moving straight along to cut your file size down. Um, and in the classroom, we would be pausing if this were a live class. Uh, but that's where we're going to be learning. Don't just trust everything I see here. Do it yourself. So when we do one variable statistics, okay, we end up getting an expected value x bar of 2.4. And that says 
That's how many jobs we are expecting. Notice that the variable X was the number of jobs. This one is asking what's the expected profit. So I'm multiplying that 2.4 by $3,000, the profit per job. And that tells us he can expect $7,200 for the profit per month. So that one had a little bit of an extra step in there that you had to pay attention to. Okay, another prize wheel problem, but this one has yet another twist. Okay, you're gonna pay $10 to spin this prize wheel. The grand prize is 5,000 and they give us the probability of one out of 2,500 chance of winning. We have a second prize with its probability. And then there are four remaining prizes, each with a one out of 500 chance of winning. But otherwise you win nothing. That's what's new about this problem. What is your expected winnings taken the $10 you spent into account? Now I'm gonna show you two ways to do the problem. Method number one follows more directly from the paragraph, but it's not the way that I prefer to go with, and I'll explain why. But method number one says, okay, let's set up a table. Each of the different prizes is listed in this first column. 5,000 prize, et cetera. And then I've associated along with it in the second column, the probability that we will win each of those prizes. One out of 2,500, one out of 1,000. And notice I have a four out of 500 chance of winning the $50 because there are four such prizes. Now, what makes this different is the bottom row there. In that bottom row, I did not tell you the probability that you lose, that you win nothing. It's just the leftovers, so to speak. We know that the second column is supposed to add up to one. So I started with one and I said, let's subtract the sum of all those numbers above it. And I will illustrate that for you on the calculator in a little bit. Now, when you do this, you get an expected value and there's a chance, a strong chance, I've seen it happen a lot, that you forget to subtract off the $10. So at the very end, you have to remember to subtract that $10 off. Now what I choose to do instead is I choose to subtract the $10 off at the very, very beginning, okay? drop the prize instead of winning 5,000, when you take that $10 you spent into account, you're really down to 4,990 as the prize. And down in that bottom row, instead of winning nothing, you're actually losing the $10. Now you have to be careful on your calculator that you enter that in as a negative 10 and not as a minus 10. Now we're gonna switch over to the calculator and we're going to, show you how to handle this one minus the sum of the above, as well as a couple of other things that show up on your calculator. So let me switch us over there right now, really quickly. And I've already got that first column typed in, and maybe I should go back down to this minus 10 and show you that we're not hitting the minus sign. I'm hitting the negative on that bottom row next to the enter sign, then my 10, to hit enter. If you hit the minus sign, you're gonna get an error. Now in the next column, it's pretty straightforward. You're gonna be typing in one divided by 2,500. Now you can see that on the bottom row of the calculator, but once you hit enter, notice what happens. It turned it into scientific notation. So you have to be aware of that and be careful as you're typing it in because you can't check your values super easily unless you know your scientific notation. This next position, one divided by 1,000, you'll notice when you hit enter, you get one one thousandth. If you're used to your decimals, you know the first digit after the decimal is the tenths column, then you have the hundredths, then you have the thousandths. So you have one in the thousandths column. So one thousandths makes sense there. Then in the next row, we're gonna type in four divided by five, 500. Uh, let me be careful here. Stat, edit. Let's go down to that position again. Try it again. Four divided by 500. 
And then in this last position down here, watch how I'm going to do it. I'm going to take one minus, I'm going to use my parentheses, open parentheses. That first value was one divided by 2,500. And then I'm going to go plus, because I'm adding these three numbers up above together, one divided by 1,000 plus four divided by 500. Close parentheses. And now when I hit enter, now we get the remainder of the values in that position there. So that's what I wanted to show you because some entry, you know, you've got to be used to using your calculator when you're dealing with those. Okay, now I'm taking us back to our main screen that we're used to. And you can see that there I have those numbers. And when you do the one variable statistics based upon those two columns, you get negative $7.10. You need to read that off in terms of money. The negative means you're actually expecting to lose money, and that becomes $7.10. Had you gone with the first method and you had forgotten to subtract the $10 off, you might have had a positive 2.9, and you'd have to take 2.9 minus the 10 to get down to the negative 7.1. So you've got to be careful in this problem. And this one introduced something a little bit new that I wanted to cover with you by going over it manually. Okay, now we move on to section 5.2, which is probably the most important section in this chapter. And this is the section that will probably show up the most on your next exam. So let's start taking a look at it. A binomial experiment. Bi is the Latin prefix for two. Um, this experiment uh, has three requirements or conditions. The first requirement or condition is that there are independent trials. One of them does not affect the outcome of another. The second is that there are two outcomes for each trial. There's that two that goes along with the binomial prefix. Then we have three, the probability of a success remains the same from trial to trial. Now, a success is in quotes because it isn't always a pleasurable thing. Sometimes a success is a death or something like that. Um, so I put it in quotes. Now, you will see me as I go through this chapter, always look at those three criterion because if even one of those three criterion is missing, it is not a binomial experiment and it falls into a whole nother category. Now let's look at three examples here. The first one is a true-false problem. If you are guessing on a true-false test from problem to problem to problem, every trial, because of the word guessing, would be an independent trial. And if it's true-false, there are two possible outcomes. And each of them has a one-half chance. And that's why the probability of a success remains the same. Now, if I'm looking at a woman having a baby and you've got a boy versus a girl again just because the first child may be a boy has no bearing on what the next child will be and so there are independent trials there are two possible outcomes a probability of a boy remains the same or a girl remains the same from trial to trial or from baby to baby now i could look at a problem as correct versus incorrect if you are guessing, let's say, on a multiple choice test, which we will be doing later in this chapter, um, there might not be just two outcomes. You might be choosing between A, B, C, and D as choices. Well, if you are guessing on a test, then again, there are going to be independent trials. Now, as far as two outcomes, if you look at it as correct versus incorrect and not A versus B, C, or D, correct versus incorrect, there's your two um, possible outcomes. And the probability of getting the problem correct, if there's four choices, would be one in four or 25% on each of those trials. So that's some critical definitions right there at the beginning that is kind of throughout this whole section. A population in, whether, in which each member is classified as either having or not having a specific attribute is called a two-category population. Now, when you are running a survey, 
Okay. Um, sampling could either be done with or without replacement, putting people's name back into the hat or not. Suppose you had a huge list containing everybody's name in the entire United States. It might have to be on a DVD or something. If you were to cross off names as you were surveying people, then you would not be calling them twice. And this would be known as doing your survey without replacement. You can't draw a person two times in a row. But then I have this question, would it make a difference if you crossed off names, if you have a huge list? Let's just pretend that you're trying to sample a thousand people from throughout the United States. And you happen to randomly sample John Doe living in Butte, Montana. And then one of your classmates happens to choose Joe, John Doe living in Butte, Montana. Now the probability that that happens is very slim, but it could happen. But the probability of it happening a second time is even slimmer, okay? And even if it were happening a couple of times, it's not gonna have a super large bearing when you're sampling a thousand people from throughout the United States. So in that sort of case, we wouldn't worry about crossing off names. We have a rule of thumb that says, if our sample size is less than 5% of the population size, then Bernoulli or independent binomial trials may be assumed. In other words, when we're sampling a thousand people from the whole United States, which has over 300 million people in it, that's way under 5%. We're not gonna have duplications. Very unlikely we will. And that's why we can do surveying without replacement, which for us is important because that allows us to have independent trials, which then allows us to apply this binomial process. Okay, let's pretend we are flipping a coin three times. Now in this first diagram here, I have created a tree diagram. On the first flip, you can have a heads or a tails, et cetera. And what I'm doing here is I'm going to draw in a one half chance of heads, one half chance of tails. And I just don't want to draw one halves all the way across here, but I could list the sample space beginning with head, 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 followed by heads, heads and tails, et cetera. And I do wanna make a comment here. And that is that each outcome in the sample space is equally likely they all have the same probability. And that probability actually is one half times one half times one half, which is equal to one out of eight. Notice that there are eight, num eight possibilities in that sample space. Now in the next example, I've got the same exact drawing drawn for you. Okay, but this time the coin is bent and there's a 75% chance of a heads. In other words, every time we go up a branch, we have a three fourths chance and going down, we have a one fourth chance. Now this is still a binomial trial. There's two outcomes. Every time you flip a coin, you have independent trials. Okay, the probability of a success a heads or a tails remains the same from flip to flip to flip. So up at the top, I've actually labeled the probability of getting three heads in a row, three fourths times three fourths times three fourths, which would be 27 out of 64. Now down at the bottom, it asks us in the question to find the probability that all three result in a tail. Well, that would be one fourth times one fourth times one fourth, which would be one out of 64. And the comment that I've got covered up here at the bottom is that each of these probabilities are not the same. And actually I've already listed the probability right there for the probability of tails, tails followed again by tails. Okay, so this is a tree diagram, not something you always have to do, but it's a good tool for us in case we can't visualize an experiment. 
Okay, now we're gonna move on to some fancier formulas. We have a formula in this next paragraph on how we used to teach it. This is the old way of doing things where you need to have a binomial coefficient and we're not even teaching combinations any longer. So I just put this in here for reference. If, I, if you ever need to use this in another class, you could make a connection between what we, you were doing in that class versus what we're doing here. But we will be using in our calculator the binomial PDF and CDF functions, which are found in the distribution menu on your calculator. If we switch to our calculator here, and I'm going to quit out of here and go back to my main screen. Your distribution button is above the VARs or variables button. You're going to hit second distribution and a bunch of distributions in this chapter and the next are in here. Now I like to scroll up from the bottom to get to binomial PDF, which is choice A, and CDF, which is choice B. When you go into, for example, PDF or CDF, it doesn't matter which one, some of you will get a menu where you're going to enter your three numbers into that menu. Others of you will just have on your screen binomial PDF open parentheses and you need to enter three numbers separated by commas. Well, these would be the three numbers that you would be entering in. Okay, now let's go back to our other screen for a little bit and into your notes. Now, what I need you to pay attention to is the difference between binomial PDF and binomial CDF. With PDF, you're finding the probability that X is equal to some number. With binomial CDF, which stands for cumulative distribution function, you're finding the probability that one of X being less than or equal to some number. Okay, so I'm going to be illustrating this for you in these next few examples, and this is going to be a very common type of problem here. So here we go. A salesperson makes eight contacts per day with potential customers. From past experience, we know that the potential a neighbor, a potential, we know the probability of a potential customer will purchase a product is 10%. Let's just pretend the person is going from door to door selling vacuums. And so knock, knock, knock on the door. Hey, will you buy my vacuum? Let me spread some dirt on your carpet and let me show you it vacuum up nice and well for you. Okay, there's the little story behind this. The question is, what's the probability he or she will make exactly two sales on a particular day? You want to zoom in on the word exactly, because that tells you we are looking that for the probability that x, our variable, will be equal to 2, that we're going to make exactly two sales. Now, because that's an equal to, we're going to be doing the binomial PDF of eight, there are eight houses we're going to, which means there's eight trials. We said the probability of a success of making a sale is 10%, so there's my second number. And then we wanna know what's the probability we make two sales. So you might have a menu like I showed you a moment ago where you're gonna enter trials, probability of success, and then in, or you're just gonna enter it this way as you see it here and out will come this value. And you know that we're gonna round this to four decimal places as is our general rule in this class. Now for part B, it's asking what's the probability he or she makes at most two sales. You need to know that at most always goes with the inequality less than or equal to. Now less than or equal to it turns out is exactly what we need in order to do the binomial CDF. So on our calculator, we'd go into that distribution menu above the variables button, VARS button, and we would type in exactly what you see here. Again, but it's eight, 0 0.1 and two, because it's a less than or equal to two. But the only difference here was back on problem A, we were going with binomial PDF, and now we're dealing with binomial CDF. So you've got to be very careful what menu you are in.
This is a less than or equal to whenever you have the words at most. Okay, the next one says, find the probability he or she makes at least two sales. Now this is not one of those two patterns that you have over at the left. At least really refers to two or more, okay? X greater than or equal to two. Well, if you go back to our two functions on our calculator, our calculator doesn't do a greater than or equal to. It only does equal to for PDF and less than or equal to for CDF. So we have to kind of play around with it to make it into something that our calculator will accept. Now, the way we do this for greater than or equal to problems is we think of, ooh, what's the opposite of two or more? The opposite of that is one or less. Okay, now, again, we're dealing with sales, and there's whole numbers of sales, two sales, three sales, four sales, one sale, no sale. You can't have one and two-thirds sales or 1.9 sales, and that's why I'm saying the opposite of two or more, instead of going 1.99999 or less, is just one or less. You can't have that decimal there. So one or less. Now, the word opposite well, that kind of says, oh, it's, we're going to be subtracting from one. It's really the complement mathematically. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm, I'm going to say one minus, and then I'm going to go into this binomial menu to generate this value. Now, let me illustrate that one for you. Okay, so let's go to our calculator just so you are comfortable doing this calculation on your own. And I'm going to quit out of here. I'm on my main screen, one minus, make sure I'm using the minus sign and not the negative sign. Then I'm gonna hit second distribution, scroll up to get to binomial CDF. I'm gonna enter the first value here of eight, followed by 0 0.1 for a 10% chance of a sale, followed by one because we want one or less. When I paste that, notice it came in right after the one minus, hit enter, and that's the same value that I had over on the other screen. So you'll have to get very comfortable with your calculator here. Now what I have next is all the different inequality patterns that can show up along with an explanation of how they work and kind of a cheat sheet on how you're gonna do them on your calculator. This, I've got a star there. This is really what you're gonna to want to reference and study for your final exam. Okay, again, I'm gonna pretend that there are eight contacts per day and there's a 10% chance of a successful sale just so I can have a number in these various positions. And we've already seen the probability of X equals two. Now, what I did here is I put a box around the two. That's what we're interested in because you can have zero through eight sales. And I wanted to just give you a visual. What's the probability that that's the number of sales out of eight? Well, we've already done this calculation and this would be the binomial PDF of eight, 0 0.1 and two. I will not be focusing on the answers on this screen. We're focusing on the patterns of what do you do on your calculator? When you have a less than or equal to two, okay, well, here you go. That would be the zero, one, or two, okay, and two or less. That right off the bat is going to be, again, at most is the key word that goes along with a less than or equal to, and that is the built-in CDF function where you put two at the end because it's two or less. Now, if I drop the equal to here and I go with um, the less than two, that's a little bit trickier because our calculator doesn't do less than. So what I'm gonna say is, hmm, under two, I'm not including the two. So that really refers to the zero or one. And another way of thinking of that is one or less. If I'm dealing with one or less, 
Now that is a less than or equal to that can be done using the CDF calculation. And here we go, 0 0.1 and one as the last number, CDF with one. And that's just the less than symbol that we began with. So I put the words here at the right so that when you see them in a word problem, you can help connect that with an actual inequality. Now, in the fourth pattern, I've got greater than or equal to two. In a picture, that's really referring to the two or more. Now, our calculator doesn't do the two or more. So we focus on the less than or equal to. The opposite of two or more is the one or less. Now, the opposite, there's my one minus, the probability of x minus is less than or equal to one. And that over here will give us the one minus the binomial of CDF ending in one. And when I had the greater than or equal to, that referred to the inequality of the words at least. Picture wise, when I have greater than two, in a picture, we're basically saying we're not including the two, we're just starting at the three, and whoops, and we're saying three and above. Well, three and above is not something we can do on our calculator, so we need to switch this around and focus on the two or less, and so switch it around. There's my one minus, the two or less, that's why I have a less than or equal to two. So in this case, this was the greater than two pattern. Whoops, let's try that again. Greater than two pattern. I'm gonna go one minus CDF and it's changing the two. I kept the two here, I keep the two. Just be careful on which pattern we're dealing with. Now I've yet to look at patterns six and seven. On pattern six, that's actually a betweenness. My X is between two and five, and we're not including the two nor the five. So picture-wise, it's everything in uh, the purple box. The three and the four are both between two and five. Now you're gonna go, okay, what's all that extra stuff we have there? I want what's in purple. My calculator cannot just find me what's in purple. So what I do is I start by saying, let's find the binomial CDF ending in four. That refers to four or less. The four or less is what's in the pink box. Well, I don't want all those values in the pink box. I wanna get rid of what's inside the orange stuff leaving the, the purple section with just the three and the four. So I'm going to subtract off, there's my minus sign, the two or less, that would be the CDF ending in two. So you gotta be careful with that pattern. Pattern seven, almost the same thing, but this time we're including the two and the five. So look at my purple box there. Ah, I want the two through five but I can't go and get just the two through five. So I'm gonna begin with binomial CDF of five. Now CDF is a less than or equal to five. So it's gonna give me everything five or below. So it's what's inside this purple loop I'm drawing here, just like I did in pink last time. Now I don't want the zero and the one. So I wanna get rid of those by subtracting off the one or less. So what do I have here at the right? I'm going to be subtracting, there's my minus sign, and the one or less with a CDF function there. Okay, so what are we seeing here? On this between pattern, when it's a pure between, let's just call this the values A and B between A and B not included in the endpoints. Notice how that five got switched to a four in the first parentheses. I'm gonna call that position there B minus one. And notice the two was my value of A, and then over here, I've actually got that value of A 
in that position. Now, if I have an equal to pattern, where I'm going to say two uh, and five are going to be represented by C and D, well, the five value is going to stay there, D. And instead of a two in the first parentheses, I'm going to subtract one. So that becomes C minus one. Now, I may have just confused you a little bit. Those of you who have had some algebra in other classes, you kind of probably like that. But basically, you, we are dealing with patterns here. You, if you've got this little cheat sheet of how do I handle this pattern at the left, it gives you the clues on how to do it over there at the right. Okay, again, this is central to our chapter. Let me give you some examples on using this now. So here we go. Now we're gonna say a true false test has 15 questions on it. We're gonna be randomly guessing at each question, what is, and here's three questions. Now let's just start here for a moment and go back to a Bernoulli trial. Two possible outcomes. Well, true and false, two possible outcomes. Okay, independent trials. Well, if we are guessing on each question, yes, then each answer is independent of the previous ones. And the probability of a success getting the question right, that stays the same from trial to trial to trial. So that does meet the three criterion for binomial trials. So we look at this problem and we say, okay, X equals six. That equal to is exactly what we're looking for. And that tells us we're going to deal with the binomial PDF function. Okay. And I did 15 trials, 0.5. You could also, instead of 0.5, gone one divided by two. And then I've got six as my third number because six correct is what we were looking for. Now, again, please pause this video repeatedly and do these calculations on your own to check yourself. When you do that one out and round to four places, you should get 0.1527. Okay, the next part, part B, is a greater than 11. I'm going to use my little picture down below here greater than 11, when there's 15 questions, I want the 12 or more. That means getting more than 11 correct. My calculator doesn't do more than. So the opposite is over here on the left, and the opposite is inside this dotted circle that I'm creating here. It's the opposite of 11 or less. So I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I'm going to go with this one minus pattern because 12 or more, the opposite is 11 or less. So opposite, that's my one minus. 11 or less, that's the CDF, and there it ends with an 11. Okay, so there we are. That's pattern, the pattern with the greater than. If you go back to the previous screen, that would be pattern number five with the greater than. Notice how the two was kept at the end of the previous problem just as on this problem, the 11 correct is staying at the end of this parentheses. Then when you do this on the calculator, you get 0 0.0176. Okay, let's move on to this X less than nine. X less than nine does not include the nine. So we're actually looking at the ones I've circled here, which are eight or below. Now, eight or below, can be done on our calculator. So I'm going to treat it as eight or below. Binomial CDF, what's my less than or equal to? Eight, the last number. Again, I've got my 15 trials and my one half chance of success, and out pops my answer of 0.6964. Problem number two totally changes the game around a little bit. We've got the US Census Bureau saying 25% of a US children are not living with both parents. That's not a success, but again, success is in air quotes here. If 10 US children are being selected at random, determine the probability that the number that is not living with both parents is 
exactly to. Now in this problem, because it says exactly to, I know we're looking for the probability that x equals to. Because it's got that equal to in it, I know it's the binomial PDF, and that's why I did PDF of, here we go, 10 children are selected, 25% chance of success or having that attribute, and two is the number we're catching. Here we go, our answer is 0.2816. And I'm not gonna be doing every single problem with you. You now know how to get into that menu on your calculator and do these calculations yourself, which is what you do want to do for every problem, especially when we've got the actual answers here to get the experience at doing it. At most two, when you see the words at most in part B, that should tell you we're dealing with a less than or equal to two problem. Now less than or equal to is exactly what the binomial CDF calculation is, less than or equal to the two at the end of the parentheses. Again, I've got my 10 children, 25% chance of success. The probability here, 0.5256. Okay, this next one says between three and six, inclusive. When I use the word inclusive, that means I'm including both the three and the six in the model. If we write this as an inequality, I've got equal to's or less than or equal to's on both parts of this compound inequality. At this point, we're going to go into that very bottom pattern, pattern number seven that I had on the previous screen. So now I'm going to say, OK, let's go with this pattern here. Notice what I did. I kept the six exactly as it was, no change. But then the three, to get down to the two, we subtracted one. Okay, now let me illustrate that for you on the previous screen. Because on the previous screen, when we had an equal to, I kept that number D, the five stayed the same. And then the first number two, we subtracted one, and there's our one over at the right. So that's exactly what I did in this problem. Three, subtract one, there's my two. And the answer to this problem, oops, should be 0.4709. It's the same problem over and over again with different little twists. Let's do another one, but this has got a couple of extra things in it. And again, I really encourage you to keep pausing your video because that's how you're gonna learn it. This time we have a 10 question multiple choice test. There are five choices per question, A through E. If you go through those three requirements for a binomial distribution, you'll see, yes, independent trials. Yes, there's two outcomes. You get it right or you get it wrong. And the probability, which in this case is one out of five, remains the same from trial to trial. Now it asks, and I'm teaching you something new, how many questions would you expect to get correct? When you have binomial trials, the formula for the expected value is mu equals NP. So in this question, okay, we have N is equal to 10 times the probability of one fifth on each question, which will equal two. Now you can think of this two ways. You can think of it as 10 times one fifth chance equals two, or you'd say, oh, there's five questions. I should get one fifth of the questions overall correct. 10 divided by five makes the two. Okay, either way, you're gonna to get to an answer of two here. That's what we would expect to get correct. So this formula, mu equals NP, is our expected value here. Now, when we get to the very end of the course, in the chi-square chapter, we will have a formula for expected values, which is E and equals NP. It's really the same formula. They're just using E for expected value, whereas right here I used mu for the expected value. Part B, what's the probability you get exactly six correct? Well, exactly six correct turns into the equal to six. Well, when it's 
equal to, that will be the binomial PDF of 10, 1 5th, 6th. There are 10 questions. You have a one in five chance. Now you could have written that as a 0 0.2 if you wanted to, I'm getting six correct. The probability here is 0 0.0055. Problem C, what's the probability you get less than five correct? Now less than five, that's just the less than symbol that you're used to. Now our calculator does not do less than. So as I showed you before, this will end up being four or less, less than or equal to four. If I go down to my chart below, and I'm not including the five, I'm really saying, okay, below five. That's the four or less, just as I've circled it. Now we go back here. That is exactly the binomial CDF of those same values with a four at the end. And when you do this on your calculator, I don't know if you're pausing this or not, there's your answer, 0.9672. Part D, you're looking at the seven or more. That turns into the greater than or equal to seven. If I look at my picture down below, I'm circling seven or more correct. Our calculator doesn't do seven or more. It needs to think of the opposite. And the opposite is, as you can see here, I'm circling the six or less. Now the opposite, that's the one minus portion of it, and there's my six or less. Now on my calculator, that's gonna become one minus, and then here we go, 10, one fifth, six. Now something interesting happens on this problem when you do this, because it's very unlikely you're gonna get seven or more correct. Something happens. On your calculator, you end up getting 8.6436E negative four. Now that stands for scientific notation here, guys. And technically that becomes 8.6436 times 10 to the negative fourth. Well, if you remember from your algebra classes, this means move the decimal place four to the left, and that gives us 0 0.0008-6436. And then when you look at that, you then round it to four decimal places and we get 0 0.0009. So a little bit trickier, you have to see that E negative four. Your answer cannot be 8.6 because all of our answers to probability questions need to be between zero and one. We can't have these solutions of eight there. Okay, what is the probability you answer correctly between two and eight questions? Now this time, we're not including the two and the eight. It's a pure inequality. So when I go look down at my picture, I'm not going to include the two and I'm not gonna include the eight. So I really have three through seven. Now inequality wise, okay, probability three less than or equal to X, less than or equal to seven. Okay, here's that between this pattern. It's pattern number seven that I showed you earlier. And this is where, again, 10 and one fifth, 10 questions, one fifth chance of each. But now the question is, which number goes in these two blanks? Think about that for a second. Okay, it turns out that the first blank is going to be the seven. We keep that seven exactly as is, and that gives us the probability of seven or less. The second blank is going to have a two in it. We take this three, we subtract one to get to that two. And that basically says we're subtracting off the two or less, less leaving the three through seven there. And when you do that on your calculator, out comes the value 0.3221.
Okay, so you're gonna want a lot of practice on these things and it takes a little time to absorb this material. Problem number four, okay. We are saying that 84.2% of US households have a DVR. Six households are being randomly selected without replacement. And what is the approximate probability that the number of households sampled from that group of six will have a DVR? Will be first off exactly four. Okay, it's just the same problem. Okay, again, independent trials because we're going throughout the whole United States, the probability that we have any repeats is slim to none. All of the people are gonna be selected at random and they're gonna be independent of each other. The probability of a success remains the same, 84.2% from house to house. And we do have um, binomial, they either have or don't have a DVR. So in this first case, this will be the probability X equals four. And on our calculator, and I'm not gonna do all the calculations out, I'm most concerned with the setup. Because it was an equal to four, I went with PDF. We were sampling six people. I'm writing that 84.2% as a decimal, 0.842. And there's the four that you see at the end. At least four. That's the greater than or equal to four. Now our calculator doesn't do greater than or equal to. So we have to say the opposite of four or more is three or less, the opposite. There's my one minus three or less. There it is ending in the three. At most five, okay, that's a less than or equal to five. Now that's exactly what we like for our calculator because that is the CDF function directly. And so that'll be binomial CDF, six trials. There's our probability of success. There's the five we're looking for. Between two and five inclusive, that means including the two or five. And I wrote this with equal twos on both ends. So now we go right back to what we did a moment ago, okay? The first parentheses, I left off the first couple numbers, but it ends in a five. We keep that second number, and then we take that two, we drop it to a one, and the second parentheses will end in a one. Okay, Whew. part E is a little bit different. Determine the probability distribution of the random variable y. Okay, wow. Well, I need to find each of these probabilities and I've actually already got the answer right here to the previous one. That's only gonna fill in from part A, the answer to four. Well, let me show you how I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna just tell you what the answers are that come out of my calculator, but let me show you how I'm gonna do this on my calculator. I'm going to go into my calculator and I'm going to enter that there were six trials. There will be a 0.842 chance of a success. That's what's up there in the problem. But I'm going to leave off the X value. Leave it off altogether. When you hit enter on your calculator, leaving off that last number, it returns a whole list to you. Notice that 1.6 E negative five, there's my 1.6 E negative five showing up there. And that shows up as one big long list. Now that's kind of hard to see and you'd really like to have it into a list position on your calculator. So what I actually did is I, once I did this on my calculator, I hit the store. I said, store the list of probabilities into L2 by hitting the store button an arrow appears on the home screen, after which you would enter L2. Let me show this to you firsthand here. Let's go to our calculator. It's where we left it a little while ago. And I'm gonna go into second distribution, go to binomial PDF. We said that there are going to be, what do we say? six trials, we're going to six houses, the probability is 0.842, and I'm leaving off that last number, hit paste, 
there's that big long list. Now I could scroll through that list if I wanted to, but that's kind of time consuming. I'm not too interested in that. So I'm gonna hit my store button, the one that just turned red on my screen. It takes the answer from the previous row, there's a little arrow and you get to tell it where to go. So I would say second L2, hit enter. And it says nothing, it just gives you that list again. But when you hit second L2, there are those values in that column there for you. And I could just type in the zero through six into list one if I wanted to by just typing over the values that you see there. But that's a way that you can manipulate your calculator and see all those probabilities rather quickly. Okay, determine and interpret the mean of the random variable y. Well, that's where we're gonna say, ah, X bar is 5.02. Hmm, where did that come from? Well, quite honestly, the easiest way to do this, instead of entering, you could have just taken this distribution and done one variable statistics on it. Another way you could have done that is you could have said mu equals NP, and you could have just taken the six, multiplied it by the 0.842, and that would have gotten you to that value also. So there's really two ways that you could have done it. As far as an interpretation goes, if six households are selected at random, we would expect 5.052 of them to own a DVR. Obviously you can't have that fractional household, but this is a long-term average that we're looking at, not something that's actually attainable. Okay, this next page here talks about the Poisson distribution. And the Poisson distribution is right next to the binomial distribution on your calculator. If we go into our calculator here, I'm gonna quit out of here. Let me clear that screen off and hit second distribution. Scroll up from the bottom. Notice in positions D and E, you've got the Poisson PDF and the Poisson CDF. When you go into either of them, it only has two inputs, the mu, which is the expected value, and then the X value you're interested in. So it's actually quite much easier than the procedure we were just doing, but the ideology and the thought process of how we do it is exactly the same. Now I've got a bunch of information here on what the Poisson distribution is, but I'm gonna go straight to number one here on that second column. Okay, characteristics. The experiment consists of counting the number of times a certain event occurs during a given unit time, a given area or volume, or some other measurable quantity how often it occurs. That's really the essence of what a Poisson distribution is. And I've got some examples above on your page there, the number of traffic accidents per month, the, noticeable, the number of noticeable service defects found by a quality control expert, et cetera. Okay, just wanted to give you a little background on what these were. You have a formula here for what your calculator is doing something that you don't need to worry about. But what is interesting is um, that the, expect, the standard deviation is the square root of lambda, which is the um, expected value. I'm just gonna leave that alone. Let's just go straight in and do some problems. Um, this is pretty easy to do. So I've got a problem that says the owner of a fast food restaurant knows that on average, this is our expected value, 2.4 cars use the drive through window in this 15 minute window span in the afternoon. Assuming there's a Poisson distribution, which they usually will tell you, okay, find the probability that there will be exactly two cars using the drive through We're expecting 2.4, what's the probability we get exactly two? So I'm gonna write probability of exactly two, and because it's an exactly equal to two, I'm gonna use the Poisson distribution and I'm gonna enter 2.4 is what we were expecting. What's the probability we get two? 
The next one says at least three. At least there's a greater than or equal to three. Our calculator doesn't do greater than or equal to, it only does less than or equal to. So we say, ooh, the opposite of three or more is two or less. So that's going to give us one minus the Poisson CDF ending in two. There's my two or less, which is the opposite of the three or more and out comes this value for you. So bottom line, if you know how to do the binomial problems, you already know how to do the Poisson problems. So I just give it a really quick mention and let you move forward with it. Okay, let's move on to some final problems here. Um, problem number one, we got a quiz containing three true false questions and you're guessing at each one. The first part says list all the different solutions. Now, that's basically going to be true, 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 false, etc. I've kind of cheated. I took that table for heads and tails that we did earlier, and I just said, you know what, instead of heads and tails, think of these as T's for trues and H's for false, and that's basically what we're doing here. And I chose to do this for you so you can see how this problem is connected to something we did um, right at the beginning of this video. What is the probability we get all three correct? Well, that would be like all three trues or all three falses. We'd have one half times one half times one half, okay, which would be one eighth. If I'm doing it using the binomial approach, I'm saying, what's the probability I get three correct? Okay, where it's either incorrect or correct. And then I would say, I'm gonna do this as a binomial PDF, three questions, three trials. I have a one half chance because it's true false of getting it correct. And what's the probability I get exactly three? And there is 0.125, which is the same as one eighth. So if I were looking at the problem up above here and I thought of this as correct, three corrects in a row, and I was going one half times one half times one half, that would equal one eighth, which is the 0 0.125. And I'm basically showing you that this is a chapter six problem the way I did it with binomial PDF, but it's also a chapter, sorry, a chapter five problem with PDF, but it's also a chapter four problem the way you learned to do it with three diagrams in the previous chapter. What's the probability of guessing all of them incorrectly? Well, that's the binomial, that's the binomial PDF. I guess I got my B and my P mixed up there. Three problems, but we're getting zero correct, but that's one eighth also. What's the probability of getting at least two questions? At least, that's the greater than or equal to two. Our calculator does not do, again, the greater than or equal to, so the opposite of two or more is one or less. So opposite, there's my one minus, one or less, there's my one, the or less is my CDF, and then I've got those same exact features, values there. And that answer is gonna be one half. Problem number two, M&M or Mars claims that 20% of its plain M&M candies are red. Okay, that's the value they're telling us is true. Find the probability that when 15 plain M&M candies are randomly selected, exactly 20% or three of them, that's three out of the 15 is 20% are red. So I wanna know what's the probability X is going to equal three, right? Three red. Okay, well, that'll be a binomial PDF because it's an equal to three. There's 15 trials, we're checking out 15 of these candies a 20% chance, there's my 0.2, and there's the three at the end. So this value will be right around 25%. Problem number three, 10% of us are left-handed. What's the probability of randomly selecting two people who are both left-handed? Okay, well, I can treat this as a binomial problem. It says, both are left-handed. That's the probability that we get X equals two lefties. 
okay? And I'm gonna say we're choosing two people, 10% chance of a left-handed person. What's the probability both of them are left-handed? And I use PDF of two, and that answer is 1%. Now, let me show this to you in an a chapter four way of looking at things. I could have drawn a tree diagram and drawn a branch and said, ooh, lefty, not a lefty. Choose another person, lefty, not a lefty. I have a 10% chance 0.1 of going up to lefty each time. And so the probability of going lefty, lefty, 0.1 times 0.1, there's my 0 0.01 there. So I'm trying to show you a second way that that problem can be done. Number four, okay, with one method of accepting acceptance sampling, a sample of items is randomly selected without replacement, and the entire batch is rejected if there is at least one, there's our inequality, defect. The NICO Electronics Company has just manufactured 5,000 CDs, and 3% are defective, they're telling us. If 10 of the CDs are selected and tested, what's the probability the entire batch will be rejected? Okay, here we go. I want to know what's the probability I have at least one defect, greater than or equal to one defect. Our calculator does not do greater than or equal to. So the opposite of one or more is zero or less. That's kind of weird to go less than or equal to zero, but the opposite, there's my one minus. So on my calculator, I'm gonna do one minus the probability of X equals zero, or one minus the binomial CDF. I can go PDF or CDF, because less than or equal to zero and equal to zero for this problem are basically the same thing. We are sampling 10 CDs, we know there's a 3% defect rate, and there's the zero at the end we're looking for. And our answer on our calculator comes out to about 26%. Continuing on here. <clears throat> if you randomly select a person from the, from the population of people who have died in recent years, there is a 0.0478 probability the person's death was caused by an accident, according to the statistical abstract. A Baltimore detective is suspicious about five persons whose death were categorized as accidental. Find the probability that when five dead persons are randomly selected, their deaths were all accidental. So five people chosen at random or five deaths are occurring there. We know the probability of an accident. What's the probability all five of them were on accident? So here's a couple ways of doing it. Method number one, the old tree diagram method saying, oh, either an accident or no accident. And then, oh, second trial, accident, no accident. And we know the probability of going up to an accident. And we just keep on going there, folks. Three more branches of accident, accident, accident to get five in a row. And we end up multiplying 0 0.0478 times itself five times. When you do that on your calculator, you end up going into scientific notation. And again, that means move the decimals seven places to the left, which means it's pretty darn slim. It's not going to be accident. There's got to be one of these that was probably non-accidental. So that's the tree diagram way of doing it. The way we're currently learning in this chapter is we're saying, okay, find the probability that there were five accidents. Let's do this as a binomial PDF, five trials, five deaths. There is the probability of an accident. And what's the probability that all five were accidents? And there's that same exact answer that you have the other way. So my first comment is this can be done either as a chapter four problem or as a chapter five problem. But my second question is, and this is the one that's probably starting to bug you a little bit, how do you know which approach to attempt? Okay, well, that comes down to your understanding of probability. 
okay? Because this chapter is the chapter five chapter, all the problems can be done using this method, the, the binomial PDFs and CDFs. However, if you're more comfortable with the previous approach or you just don't see the way that it fits into a binomial type of problem, that's when you go with the other one. And it's a harder question for me to answer. And probability, quite honestly, is one of those tougher topics there. Some people really get it, others have to struggle with it. And it's just after exposure to a lot of problems that you tend to get better at it. Okay, two last questions. I know this has been a long video. When you give a casino $5 for a bet on the number seven in roulette, you have a one out of 38 probability of winning $175 and a 37 out of 38 probability of losing the $5 bet. What is your expected value? In the long run, how much do you lose for each dollar? Okay, what I've done is I've drawn a little tree diagram here that represents a roulette wheel. It's got 18 reds, 18 blacks, and two green slots. And that's where the 38 comes from. There's 38 numbers to choose from, one through 38, sorry, one through 36, and then there's a zero and a double zero on green. So that's where the one out of 38 chance of getting the rolling the seven comes from. Now for this problem, and I wanna find the expected value, I'm going to list my two outcomes of winning $170, but I'm taking into account the $5 I lost, and there's a one out of 38 chance, or I lose my $5 and there's a 37 out of 38 chance. When you do that on your calculator with the one variable statistics, there's my expected value, basically negative 0.39. That's my expected value. How much do you lose for each dollar? We expect to lose 39 cents for each dollar you spend. That's basically the idea there. Finally, number seven, according to the US Department of Justice, 5% of all US households experienced at least one burglary last year. But Newport police report that a community of 15 homes experienced four burglaries last year. By finding the probability of getting four or murglar, more burglaries in a community of at least 15 homes, does this seem that it's common or just unlucky? Okay, so it's worded a little bit differently, but it's the same type of question. We want to know what's the probability of getting four or more out of 15 homes burglarized? Probability of X greater than or equal to four. There are 15 homes that we're dealing with, so that will be what we're looking at. And I've got four or more, there's my picture. I didn't want to go all the way up to 15. Our calculator won't do the four or more, so we're going to focus on the opposite, which is the three or less. So here we go. One minus the probability of three or less. That then becomes one minus the binomial CDF of 15 homes, 5% chance of being burglarized less than or equal to three times. And there is our probability, which basically if you round it to four places, 0 0.0055. This is about half of a percent chance. Does this seem to be common or just unlucky? I'm gonna say this is unlucky because it just shouldn't be happening this way by natural occurrence. This is kind of a very small probability in this case. Okay, good luck on your homework, folks. This has been a long video and a little bit challenging, I know. You can do this though.